dog may lessen just not bothering to plan. That's a question for teflologists. When I read this book, it's better to skim or scan. That's a question for teflologists. Can you be a good teacher if you have a CELTA? Or should you invest in an MA or a DELTA? From politics to methodology, we'll discuss them all on Teflology. Hello, I'm Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to the Teflology Podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Teflologists. TEFL News. So today's uh, TEFL News, it's, it's a real piece of news, okay. and it's TEFL related. Mm-hmm. That's so, good. Yeah, it qualifies. <laughs> Unlike our others. Unlike our others, this actually does qualify. And this is probably a story that many of our listeners and maybe you guys have already heard of, mm. um, which is a £20 million language fund that's been launched by our Prime Minister himself, yeah. Dr. David Cameron. <laughs> is he a doctor? No. Pro- probably an honorary doctor somewhere. Yeah. yeah. He's probably an MA Oxon, right? Or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, anyway, this £20 million pound language fund is for uh, teaching English mm. That's to, good. to uh, British uh, residents, okay. including citizens. I'm not sure exactly, but yeah. Mm. Um, have you heard about this? Uh? Yes, okay. I've heard some of the different viewpoints on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. So one, this is, it's, there's a, a lot of controversy attached to this, um, and part of it is that uh, I think last year, so... 2015, um, he, David Cameron was part of um, uh, cuts, I think maybe about twice that amount, 40-something million, mm. cuts to universities' uh, language teaching programs. Right. So he's... Um, and, every, well, and everything else in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Policing, so, uh, so it's kind of two steps back and then one step forward right. in, in terms of uh, English language uh, education. Mm-hmm. Um, so have you heard anything else about the story? Uh, I heard that it was targeted towards specific groups. Yes. Yeah. 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 So what I'm not sure, to be honest, after reading the story, I'm still not sure if the if the program is targeted at specific mm. groups or if the, the, the money will go to a variety of groups and Mr. Cameron just chose to, when explaining <laughs> it, to, to target the group that he thought it might be most uh, useful for. Well, which group is it? Maybe we should be clear so the audience isn't confused. Yeah, of course. Um, so he, he mentioned Muslim women, specifically. Mm. Yeah. Um, and any ideas why he thought that it's important that Muslim women are, are taught English? Oh, Muslim yeah. women who, who live in the UK, obviously. Yeah. I guess it's something to do with integration, um, probably to do with the idea that the, the men in the families work and, and interact more with the community, and the, the female members of the family don't, perhaps, and so that's mm-hmm. why they're being talked. I, I, I don't know, but yeah. that's, that's yeah, what yeah. I guess. Should we go? This is Muslim women that weren't necessarily born in the UK that have perhaps come over with with their family or spouse? I assume so. Again, it wasn't very clear if... if if yeah, if if they were born in the UK or if they became if yeah. migrants to the UK, mm-hmm. um, you'd think if they were born in the UK, they probably wouldn't need the language support as per- much. Yeah, perhaps not. I have I have heard anecdotally of mm-hmm. stories of not necessarily um, um, Muslim women, um, but other groups. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. and maybe it, maybe people expect that more in the states, that kind of thing. Right. Um, but I know of of people who have worked in London. Um, teaching groups of people who maybe were born in the UK mm. um, but grew up without, without being able to speak English. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, so um, part of what, what uh, Mr. Cameron said um, when, he, when he launched this fund was he wanted an end to the passive tolerance, that was the phrase he used, mm. um, of separate communities um, which allows many Muslim women um, to face discrimination and social isolation because right. of their lack of English. So he was pitching this as like he was doing a favor for the Muslim women. <laughs> yes. Particularly, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because he needs to uh, liberate them from the backward attitudes, another quote, and the mm. damaging control of, of um, the men in these women's lives. Right. <laughs> who, who said that? Mr. Cameron. Right. Dave. Dave. Yeah. 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 So uh, there's a. Are you sure a, it wasn't Nick Griffith? <laughs> <laughs> there's a full quote I, I'd like to read. So he says, it is time to change our approach. We will never truly build one nation 
And this was actually written in the Times, I think. And One Nation, capital O, capital N. Right. So this is a, a thing, apparently. <laughs> we'll never truly build One Nation unless we're more assertive about our liberal values, more clear about the expectations we place on those who come to live here and build our country together, and more creative and generous in the work we do to break down barriers. Mm. Okay. Which sounds okay, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> but I think there's some... I think there's some slightly problematic things snuck in there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. How is this money going to be spent? It probably you probably come on to that, but you said 20 million? Tw- uh, 20 million. That's not a huge amount, is it? Really? In the grander scheme of things, that's not a huge amount. I mm. guess not. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. It seems but like if you think about that, that could pay 20 million backpackers for <laughs> one day. <laughs> well, I'm wondering, yeah, that book. Is, this going, <laughs> is this going to schooling? Are they going to set up schools? They're going to set up, they're going to basically schools? organize classes. Right. So, the, so the, some of them, they said the, um, the government estimates there's about 190,000 Muslim women in England who speak little or no English. Mm-hmm. So that is, uh, yeah. Um, they say the classes will be held in homes, schools, community centers, etc., Travel costs will be covered. Childcare costs will be covered. Mm. So yeah, I don't know the details of you know you sign up for the classes or how it works. But yeah, is that that's about twenty pounds per woman? <laughs> is that right? Uh, so ten, ten pounds per woman. Ten, ten pounds per woman. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not a lot. I mean, uh, where how are they going to pay for teachers on ten pounds per woman? Well, you put ten in a class together, yeah. and you pay the teacher ten pounds an hour. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a going rate. It's about right. Yeah. For 10 hours okay, of yeah. teaching. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, something not, like that. it's not a great amount, really. It's not a great amount, yeah. yeah. I, I, don't know, I don't know the details of how they're going to, um, to use the money. I think, yeah, it's... Well, I think there's a few issues to talk about. First of all, I think the first issue is this idea that um, the people in a, in a foreign country need to learn the language of that country. Mm. Um, and then secondly, there's the idea that the government will spend money to help those people learn that language. Right. And obviously, it varies depending on the, on the country. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. We are uh, migrants to Japan. Mm. We, all, we all live and work in Japan. Um, we probably came without speaking much Japanese. Yeah. The Japanese government certainly didn't pay for us to learn Japanese, to mm. inter- help us integrate into <laughs> Japanese culture. Not really. But there's a lot of free municipal classes that's true and that's I'm true. wondering if this but they already have that in the UK they do though, so yeah. Yeah. You know, things are already being done you know? mm-hmm. I mean I, my question really was uh, was how they're defining Muslim women I mean does this count yeah. Indonesian women Uyghurs I mean like <laughs> right right like uh, how are they are they just saying Muslim women who look like what you'd expect a Muslim woman to yeah. look like well yeah you know? I think yeah I think that's a big part of it M- maybe part of the problem here um, or, or the problem the problem according to some people um, so the yeah so part of it is fighting um, maybe radicalization mm. yeah um, ho- hoping to stem I don't know you know percent I don't know numbers it's probably you know much less than people imagine yeah I think we can support it though as a, as a goal fighting radicalization oh yeah yeah sure yeah. I don't think teflology stands in support <laughs> <laughs> just you know let people do what they want to do <laughs> <laughs> liberal values <laughs> yeah, well yeah exactly um, so I don't it's there wasn't I think when Cameron mentioned it he didn't draw a clear connection between it but people are this the idea of the numbers of, of Britons Brit- British citizens who are either doing it or are trying to you know for example join I- ISIS right. that kind of thing um, probably they all speak English. The people who do that is my yeah. suspicion. But well, it's like you know, old um, Jihadi John, and he, he, you know that's how, why he's got that name because of his English yeah. <laughs> his accent. <laughs> right. Do you think? I mean, he talks about integration. Do mm. you think that, say, for example, this is used for classes with teachers? Mm. Do you think that's really the the best place for this uh, in- integration to play out? Surely it would be better to just work on, like, kind of grassroots. You know, yeah, small community incentives. Getting right. people to speak to each other, and you know the English will obviously be used. So, right. You know, I mean the the so the, this idea of this this phrase used backward attitude. So he obviously he's associating people, uh, especially I guess he, especially Muslim people who don't speak English. Mm-hmm. Um, so to be clear, he he was saying the backward attitudes were the Muslim men, mm-hmm. a, a minority of Muslim men. Yeah. Who do um, maybe 
have undue control over their the women in their families mm -hmm. and maybe don't allow them to speak English. Yeah. Um, and, and part of it is fighting that. But also, I guess, it's um, hoping to integrate these people more into British culture mm -hmm. by being able to speak English. Yeah. Um, do you think that's a good thing? I don't I think it's for him to say backwards attitude, though. Like, mm. Because from mm. where they're from, that's... You know, it's it's not for him to call that back our our prime minister, but for him to use <laughs> those words, I don't think it's helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. You know, like it's yeah. not great use of language, is it? <laughs> yeah, and, and even just for the effect that it would have on those people, like how they would yeah, respond yeah, to yeah, it, yeah. and also it it ignores all of the different reasons that immigrants don't learn languages. It's it's right. not all you know. It's not all because of attitudes. You know, it's very I'd say it's very rarely because of attitudes. Most of the time, when people don't learn a language, I think uh, my understanding is that it's because they're in communities where they don't need to learn languages. Yep. Yep. You know, so like you were saying, community outreach would be better. Mm. Try and find ways of integrating communities and you know, getting people to interact with each other. That would play a much bigger role in just you know saying, "Hey, you with your backwards attitudes, here is ten pounds. Go and learn a language." <laughs> you know? Right, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I think I don't know, may maybe. We think it's a nice idea for the government to, to provide uh, pre-English language education for people mm. who want it. Ten pounds worth. <laughs> Ten pounds worth. <laughs> well, that's, that's if, yeah, okay. Um, but, yeah, may, maybe the way it's framed or the, the target audience um, should be more considerably careful. Mm. Considerably careful. <laughs> I think you know these lessons. <laughs> yeah. I've got a ten on. <laughs> How do I apply these? <laughs> Okay, that was uh, this week's TEFL News. TEFL Cultures. Okay, so for today's TEFL Cultures, I'd like to talk about um, independent groups within the wider field of ELT. Okay. And I'll ex I'm going to just pick one example just for time today. Um, but these groups are often set up on the fringes of conferences mm -hmm. and are not necessarily affiliated to the big wider organizations right. like TEFL or um, JALT or TESOL, for example. Yeah, right. like the slam dance to the Sundance <laughs> Festival. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not, I, it, that, I've made it sound there like it's kind of like an anonymous group or some mm. kind of group like that, but it's not at all. It's like they are independent groups set up. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about one group in particular. Mm -hmm. um, this group is the C group. Okay. Mm. C, you, C as in the letter or C as in S? -E? The letter, the C group. Okay. Um, have you come across this group before? <laughs> have they knocked on your door? <laughs> you mean it like that? You know? uh, no, but I'm desperately trying to figure out what the C would stand for. What do you think it stands for? The cartoons. Cartoon. Um, Creative. Crunchy. Yeah, that's right. Creative. Crunchy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the main, there's a lot of C's they use, but ah, the okay. main C is creativity. Okay. Hmm. Um, however, they also stress uh, conflict, mm -hmm. contradiction, critical, and cooperation as being other meanings. It's like those uh, bands right. in the eighties that were called that had like just initials for their names, and every time someone asked them, they just said something, something different. different, like yeah. um, uh, MDC. Yeah, they were one. Okay, REM. Um, yeah, yeah. E yellow. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. I bet the C group are none of those things. I bet they're, they're not, not creative not. or... Oh, no, they are very creative. Yeah. Um, and from a conversation with one of our future interviewees, Jane Spiro, who is a member of the group, the group was set up around two or three years ago at IATF or conference in Harrogate. Or mm -hmm. Harrogate. Um, but I could be wrong about that. It might be earlier. But okay. That's, mm -hmm. That rings a bell. Um, yeah, so it was set up at this conference by a group of individuals. Um, some of the notable members are Adrian Underhill, mm -hmm. um, Alan Maley, yep, yep. Uh, Jill Hadfield, mm -hmm. Jim Scrivener, yep. and Marjorie Rosenberg, huh. who coincidentally yeah. is the president of IA Tefl. Mm. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> she's actually part of this group, but it's not a right. IA Tefl <laughs> affiliated Real group. Real re rebellion faction. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's, there's nothing rebellious about it. I mean, I mean it's not a SIG. Um, Alan Maley stresses that it's not a SIG or a charity. It's just a kind of an informal group of mm. people. That, it's a club. Uh, it's a club. And they have a website. They meet in a treehouse. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, they have some aims on their website. As I said, they have a web. That's their main kind of um, shop front, I guess, mm -hmm. their website. And they talk about the aims. And the C group's aims uh, to collabor collaboratively share information, mm -hmm. promote reflection and inquiry, 
and encourage action through more creative and open teaching practices. Okay. The key word being creative again. Mm -hmm. um, also to make classroom practice more inspiring and therefore more effective. Okay. And they believe that the outcome is it will create a cornucopia of concrete ways, techniques, inquiry and strategies for making more creative and inspiring, making the classroom more creative and inspiring for teachers and learners. Okay, right. How, How do they disseminate these ideas? They, what, what do you mean, for example? I mean, how, how do they get these ideas out to, yeah. to us? Do, do us they, uh, what, what do they actually do? What, what, yeah. what concrete cornucopias of collaborative <laughs> I imagine creativity they, do they I imagine they, do? they meet like twice a year on an island somewhere. I don't know if they have <laughs> any... Tree house, produce right. lots of great materials and ideas and then send them out yeah. for publication to put various... Put in bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so from, from what I can tell, this group is still kind of finding its feet. And okay. as Alan Maley says, it's not a SIG or a charity, mm. but they are looking for more people that want to be coordinators of it and kind yeah. of bring it closer together. Mm -hmm. But um, at this year's IA TEFL in Birmingham, there will be a, a pre-conference event right. that they're hosting in conjunction with another SIG. I can't remember which SIG. Mm. Not another SIG. They're not a SIG. No, sorry. With a, a, yeah. with a SIG. They're going to host an event. Um, a SIG and C group. <laughs> which, will have, <laughs> which will have presenters. They're going to have like presentations, like a kind of a mini conference yeah. kind of thing. And they talk about the aim... Um, moving away from the limited view of creativity as fun and games to creativity as empowerment, spontaneity, and social action. Mm. But I mean, this, I mean, these people, the, the list of people that you mentioned, a lot of them are involved in that very regular classroom practice anyway, like Scrivener, you know. Yeah. And, and they all write, yeah, they all publish books. And yeah. So, like, what? Present at conferences. Why do they think that? Well, teachers I mean, that's aren't out there doing this already. I mean, I, I th I've met people who I'm sure are, you know, are doing that kind of thing. They, well, that's what took yeah. my interest when, uh, when uh, Jane first mentioned it. I thought, this sounds good. This sounds like there's this kind of a hidden, not, not really a secret group, mm. but a group that's not affiliated with anyone, like a secret. Right. But how, what does that add to them? Not, I mean, yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's my question. That's what I'm oh, trying right. to find out. <laughs> and I, I don't think they know themselves necessarily yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think they've... Mm -hmm. Like I looked at them on Twitter and they didn't. They only had like a hundred followers. Right. So it's quite a small, tiny. Five. I don't times think many people know them. <laughs> so I was, I was hoping to use this today as a way to maybe pr perhaps promote them and get them some more interest as well, <laughs> um, if possible. Give them the technology bumps. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's going to help, to be honest. But um, right. well, we'll keep an eye on their development anyway. Just some information about their website. It's the Creativity Group dot Weebly. Mm -hmm. dot com slash blog where you can find all this information and on the website themselves they obviously they have a manifesto okay of course. which um you can find more on there but it's quite long but you can find it on their website right um and they're also involved in a number of creative projects so some of the the members have done other things and they they put this on the website mm. for example there's online reading groups there's also um alternate awards to the elton eltons mm -hmm. right called the Fair List mm -hmm. UK, have you heard of that? Mm, no. Which celebrates gender balance at ELT events. Okay. So mm. they look at the plenary speakers and the presenters and they award awards to the conference organisers who have the best. Actually, I, I did see this on, I saw some, oh. some discussion of this on Twitter, I did see about that, yeah, yeah. Right. Hmm. So that's how, another way that they're involved. Um, and also they have like... Hashtag IATEFL so male. <laughs> <laughs> no, they do, they do, there's a special yeah. hashtag for it, I can't remember what it is now, but there's not. And there's also like the Asia Teacher Writer Group, which is, was set up by Alan Malley as well, mm -hmm. Alan Maley as well. Yeah. So they do have these these things that they're all involved with, and they. Mm. I think this C group is just a way to kind of bring it all together in one place. Right. And yeah, okay. what do you think of this kind of uh, group? This yeah, this style group. I think. I mean, I, I, I've got nothing against the idea, um, but I do. I do wonder how useful it is to have, again, a group of people who are quite big names. Um, being in, involved in this kind of thing, kind of assuming that teachers aren't already doing this stuff. Because, mm. I mean, the teacher, like a lot of teachers are following what these people have told them to do in the first place, <laughs> like someone like Scrivener or, or Underhill. Yeah. This is what yeah. they do, you know. Mm. Um, and I think that a lot of teachers are very creative in the classroom. And it's the kind of creativity that, you know, doesn't really flourish when you do your training, you know. Mm. It's, so, in assuming that teachers aren't doing this, it's almost like they're kind of co-opting... 
Yeah. I don't think it assumes that they're not doing it. I think it just wants to kind of shed light on it and have a place for those ideas. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the members create that kind of space for it, maybe. And it's an informal group. I don't think they... They don't have their own journal yet. Mm. The website links to projects that are going on. Yeah. And different approaches, different articles and books that have been written. It's all Mm. there on the website. I mean, that that sounds like... that. That sounds like that would be a, a really nice use of this kind of group mm-hmm. is to you know maybe create lots of local projects mm. and promote yeah. you know what it seems like. people who are not you know well known right right that kind of thing mm. and, and as I said uh, yeah I hope to find more of these kind of influent well kind of independent groups I'm sure there are more out there but that was just one example for today mm. mm-hmm. um, yeah so that's today's Tefl culture the C group. Tefl pioneers. Today's Tefl pioneer is Dionysius Thrax. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it is. Start again. <laughs> it's Dionysius Thrax. This it is. is. That's a villain in a video game. Dionysius Thrax. Oh, it is, yeah. This is our, our oldest Tefl pioneer oh, today. Okay. Um, writing in the He's second. Got my attention, huh? <laughs> the second century BC. He was a Hellenistic uh-huh. grammarian. <laughs> which okay. means. Where was he from? Greece. Greece, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he was born in Alexandria uh, and he lived and worked. Both Egypt, in, then. Well, yeah, whatever. Okay. Um, he, he worked both there and in Rhodes. Um, okay. And Construction. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> worked in Rhodes, not on Rhodes. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> Bad construction worker. Um, he was a pupil of Aristarchus of Samothrake, hmm. uh, who was a grammarian who was the librarian in the Library of Alexandria and also Ooh. the most influential scholar of Homeric poetry of his day. Um, so why isn't he our oldest? Uh, our well, because he, he didn't do he okay, didn't no, no, no. language like no. um, So uh, before I talk about uh, Dionysius's his influences, mm-hmm. um, I have a question. Uh, all Greeks had to learn a second language at school. What language would you say the Greeks at, at that were time. learning at that, that time? time? Yeah, um, I'm going to say English. You're going to say English. Tefl Pine. Let's try. I'm going to say... Um, Al... What's that language that Jesus was in? Al... 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 Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah. Farsi. <laughs> Syrian. <laughs> Latin. Sanskrit. Um, Amoraic. Amoraic. Yeah. Is that there? Yeah, uh, no, the answer oh. is Greek. Okay. They had to learn um, ancient Greek because they spoke more. They spoke more modern Greek, and they had to learn ancient Greek. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the second language for all of the spe- for all of the Greek speakers was Greek. Huh. Weirdly, um, so in secondary schooling uh, in in Greece, um, reading and writing were taught through close examination of Greek literature, uh, poets, epic poets, and historians. Can you think of a, a famous Greek Homer. writer? Homer. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Homer was the main one. Okay. Um, and students would first produce copies of a text, and then they'd study the tone and the inflections that they needed to give dramatic recitations of these texts. Mm. Okay? Mm-hmm. So this was how they studied the languages. Um, in terms of writing, there was a series of activities that the students went through called progymnasmata. Mm. Progymnasmata, I think that's how you say that. Um, which were intended to improve their oratorical and their argumentative skills. Mm. Um, and so some examples of these, uh, they started with very simple ones and then they moved on to more complex ones. Um, so a simple example of a pro nasmata is to retell a short and simple story. So they hear a story or they read a story, then they have to retell it, which yeah. maybe we do in the classroom now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. uh, another example would be to write a summary of a text within a limited number of lines. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Like Twitter. Yes, yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Um, and then they had very uh, complex examples as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you an example. This is uh, from a book by Garen Wheeler, which came out quite recently, um, called Language Teaching Through the Ages. Um, so this is a, a quite an, an advanced example of the kind of thing they do. Um, so suppose a student was given the saying, um, Isocrates says, the roots of education are bitter, but the fruits thereof are sweet. Okay? Mm-hmm. They would uh, give a presentation in eight paragraphs, mm-hmm. where first they would give an introduction to Isocrates and a eulogy on him. Okay. Then they would paraphrase his aphorism in three lines. Then they would give a defense of his opinion. Then they would give a proof by contrast refuting the contrary opinion. Mm-hmm. Then they'd give an illustration by analogy. 
then an illustration by anecdote, quotations from old authorities in support, and finally a conclusion, which would be something like, such is Isocrates' excellent saying about education. <laughs> All in 120 characters. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was how uh, this um, schooling system was organised. Teaching at the time was a very low status position. It was often done by slaves, vagrants, drifters, and so on. And the lower down you went in the education system, the more disreputable the teachers. So it, like elementary schooling was all taught by like axe murderers and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and Dionysius Thrax, the grammarian, produced uh, a work with the intent of helping teachers to teach classical Greek to students. Mm-hmm. Okay? And this book was called The Art of Grammar. It's the first extant grammar of Greek. Mm-hmm. Um, so he defines grammar as the practical knowledge of the general uses of poets and prose writers. Um, and this is his introduction to the, uh, the grammar, which I've got a copy of here, translated into English. Mm-hmm. Um, he says there are six parts to it. First, reading aloud according to prosody. Second, explanation according to existing usage among writers. Third, the useful rendering of words and their meanings. Fourth, the discovery of etymology. Fifth, an account of grammatical paradigms, and sixth, the appraisal, uh, the appraisal of written works, which is the finest of all parts in the system. Hmm. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, so this book, it was fifteen pages long. Okay. How long do you think this was used for um, as a way of studying Greek? This fifteen-page-long little pamphlet. It's still being used today. A long time. <laughs> Almost uh, over a thousand years. Wow. It was used for, um, and. What's notable in terms of Tethel mm. is that the model of language description that Dionysius developed was adopted by the Romans to describe Latin mm. and then by other cultures, by other languages, and right. it's still almost the same as the way we describe language today. Wow. Um, so other scholars, for example, Plato, Aristotle, had discussed the nature of language, um, but they didn't describe it in quite such a, uh, a complex way. For example, uh, Plato's list of parts of speech mm-hmm. contained just nouns and verbs. He thought right. everything was just nouns and verbs. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? Um, but Dionysius's list mm-hmm. um, contained, listen to this carefully, uh, nouns, verbs, participles, articles, pronouns, prepositions, adverbs, and conjunctions. Okay. Okay? No particles. <laughs> no particles. <laughs> well, what, what's the major thing that's missing from that list? Uh, say it again. Adjectives. Adjectives. Adverbs? Ad- adjectives. Ah, adverbs in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, huh. And the reason for that was because they considered adjectives, or Dionysius considered adjectives to be nouns. Right. So the example that Wheeler gives in his book is, um, John is a man, mm-hmm. John is old. Right. And both of those are describing John. Yeah. So mm-hmm. they, they considered them to be the same kind of word. Yeah. Mm. Um, so from... Uh, from Dionysius' day down to day, we still use Dionysius' um, organisation, description of the parts of speech mm. to teach. Uh, yeah. Mm. I guess maybe also adjectives conjugate in the same way as, as nouns? In, in, in Latin, I think. They do. Mm. Maybe yes, in Greek yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah there, are, there, there are some other reasons to do with yeah, the, the way that they conjugate, the way that they, uh, they yeah, change their forms, that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So I've got a copy of uh, The Art of Grammar. Um, and... In it, he describes the whole of the Greek language, um, the classical Greek language, mm-hmm. in, uh, in just 15 pages. Okay. It's very brief. Um, so see what you think of these descriptions. See if you agree. Okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Punctuation. There are three punctuation marks, full stop, medial stop, and comma. Mm-hmm. The full stop indicates a completed thought, the medial a pause for breath, and the, uh, and the comma is a thought that is not yet complete or lacking. Huh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Would you agree with that? I'm not sure about the comma one. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not sure how that would be used. Medial, how would, how would that look? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's not listed. Like a not yet complete. I like the idea. Like you start a sentence, you're not sure how to finish it, you just put a comma in. Right. <laughs> <and> leave it. <laughs> but surely they'd be doing this as they were writing as, as they were thinking. Mm. Right. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have the capacity to go back and edit the stuff. And right, right. Well, actually, they be four straight on paper. Well, they, they, did, they could go back and edit because they used these wax styluses. Where, so they, they right. scraped onto the wax with like a pen, and then the other end of the pen had a kind of a spoon-shaped thing where you could flatten the wax out and start again. Mm-hmm. So they could go back and re-edit what they were doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like an etch-a-sketch. <laughs> like a very old etch-a-sketch. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, how about this? Accent is the harmonious resonance of the voice. Uh, sorry, harmonious resonance <laughs> of the voice. Rising with the acute even with the grave, and uh-huh. broken with the circumflex. 
Yeah. <laughs> Would you agree? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 From, maybe from your French studies, you recognize those as the different, different mm-hmm. accents they use in French. Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> difference between a full stop and comma. Ah. The difference is time. Ah. The distance conveyed by the full stop is great. By the comma, quite small. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, and we'll do one more. Uh, reading is the fluent rendering of poetry and prose. It must be done with expression, prosody, and measure. From the expression, we see the worth of the piece. From the prosody, the skill of the reader. From the measure of the mind, the writer. Thus, our reading of tragedy is heroic. Comedy, conversational. Elegies, light. Epic, emphatic. Lyric, harmonious. Dirges, subdued and mournful. For non-observance of these destroys the virtues of the poets and makes the skill of reader ludicrous. Mm. It's almost like acting, acting lessons. Yeah. Well, you can see that how much recitation and <laughs> rhetoric played into language learning at this time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot more of this. Um, he describes all of the different parts of speech in very great detail. Um, so when he describes the section on the noun, for example, it's like five pages long. Um, mm-hmm. And it has uh, different classes of noun, derivative, patronymic, possessive, comparative, diminutive, derived, superlative, and adverbial, and mm-hmm. so on. Um, so he goes into quite a lot of detail, even in his little classes. But I think the, the most important thing is that without Dionysius's descriptions, we perhaps wouldn't have uh, descriptions of language as we do today. We still use his descriptions. So what do you think? How, how um, influential do you think Dionysius is? <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, it's always hard to tell people that long ago. If he hadn't done it, somebody else would have, maybe. Right, right. But you, know, you don't know. Yeah, it may, may have ended up with a completely different system. Mm. So. Mm. Yeah, I think you've shown how important he is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. He's Tefl Pioneer worthy. Yeah. He's, he's Tefl Pioneer year. zero. <laughs> <laughs> year zero of Tefl Pioneer. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'll, I'll continue with another grammarian on the next time I do a segment of this. But, um, but for now, that was this episode's Tefl Pioneer, Dionysius Thrax. So as usual, thank you for listening. And if you'd like to get in contact with us, you can send an email to teflology at gmail.com or you can follow us on Twitter at teflology. We also now have a Facebook page. If you search for teflology on Facebook, you'll find it. Um, So if you have any comments about the episode, you can contact us through there as well. Um, You can maybe have discussions with other listeners underneath. Yeah. And we've also recently put together a website. Um, You can find that at www.teflology-podcast.com. And that's going to be our, well, it is, our, I guess, our home from now on. So you, you can find everything there, all our episodes, all our contact details. So do check that out. <laughs> Not our individual contact <laughs> details, listeners. Yeah. Yeah. You can also see what uh, Matt and Rob look like. Yeah. Yeah. No, and you, you're on there. You're on there. We, yeah. Am I? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. You don't know, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you took a picture of me when I wasn't looking. Yeah, when yeah. you were sleeping the nice. other night. <laughs> we drew your eyes on there. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, so it's uh, goodbye from me. Uh, Goodbye from me. Goodbye.